Hello and welcome to this C4U Net Rapido event here in the COP26 Nordic Pavilion. This event is looking at the role of carbon capture and storage in climate mitigation and we're going to talk about what role CCS and negative emissions technologies can play in our decarbonisation efforts and how they feature in climate models and scenarios and mitigation strategies. I'm Ruth Herbert, Chief Executive of the Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Uh, it's a trade association promoting the commercial deployment of carbon capture use and storage technologies. So I'm just going to introduce this session by talking just a little bit about what are NETS and CCS and what the kind of development timeline for these technologies has been. And then I'm going to introduce our speakers who each have a little bit to say to you and then we will open up for questions. So uh, negative emissions technologies, NETS, otherwise I think sometimes referred to as CDR, carbon dioxide removals or greenhouse gas removals. So just to be clear what we're talking about, these are a set of technologies uh, for actively removing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. They can include large scale afforestation, uh, forest ecosystem restoration, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, direct air capture and storage of carbon dioxide and other things like uh, soil enhancement. Uh, carbon capture and storage uh, is a, a process of capturing emissions from a point source uh, at the point where they would have been emitted into the atmosphere or when they are produced during it, say uh, an energy or industrial process and then transporting it either by pipeline or perhaps ship uh, to a permanent store. So those are the technologies we're here to discuss today. Um, just a little bit about the development timeline for these technologies. Actually, um, NETS has been around for over 20 years now. Uh, uh, Large-scale engineers' NETS were first considered uh, in looking at kind of more ambitious climate mitigation uh, pathways, but the progress has been slow and there have been sustainability concerns over some technologies, uh, for example, BEX, uh, due to the use of bio, en bio, um, uh, um, uh, bio energy based uh, materials. And then there have been positive developments, for example, in the Nordic countries, uh, because of their forestry sector, they can get sustainable biofuels. And so we've seen the Swedish government preparing uh, a compensation scheme for BEX developers through reverse auctions. So sort of slow development, but some sort of glimmers of hope there for, for, for NETS. With CCS, I think uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal experience of the development of CCS. Again, like NETS, been around for many decades. The technologies have been well known for many decades. There's the slight in the field in Norway, which has been storing CO2 in a, a saline aquifer under the seabed for uh, over 20 years safely and monitoring that. So there's a lot of experience with storage. Um, in terms of regulatory frameworks, for example, um, CO2 that is stored uh, permanently geologically uh, has been classified as avoided emissions under the European Emissions Trading Scheme for many years, since 2008, and is subject to a clear permitting regime. Um, but there are other sort of forms of carbon dioxide removals that have yet to have those kind of equivalent frameworks. Um, in the UK, CCS has been very stop-start, unfortunately. Uh, uh, last time I worked on it 10 years ago, we were about to uh, get a competition project away and, and that was cancelled and there was a similar process in 2015. Um, really, they didn't take off in the UK uh, uh, as they have recently um, until the government had a clear uh, and binding uh, emissions reduction target, which is 78% by 2035. And the Climate Change Committee in the UK has now said CCS is no longer an option. It is a necessity. We cannot meet our legally binding target in the UK without it. So when you start to see those targets emerge, uh, I think that's when you're going to start to see these technologies take off. But I want to hear what the panelists have to say about that. So without further ado, um, I've got Kian De Kleiner here um, from C4U. She's a PhD student at the Department of Environmental Science at Radboud University. 
and her research focuses on the contribution of CCUS and climate change mitigation. So Kian, please, let's hear from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I've been asked to tell you a little bit about um, the overall role of climate change, of uh, carbon capture and storage and also carbon dioxide removal in climate change mitigation. And I will do this first based on the IPCC special report on one and a half degrees, um, that to which I contributed and was a chapter scientist for. And afterwards, uh, just the one slide about my own research uh, on the role of, climate of, of CCS uh, in mitigation. Um, so these are the global emission pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and I guess this, is, this picture is very uh, familiar to most of you. We see the global total net CO2 emissions need to go down from uh, around 40 billion tons of CO2 per year that we are currently at, halving uh, by the year 2030 and all reaching um, zero or roughly net zero uh, in the year 2050. Um, we also see that CO2 emissions become net negative after 2050. And what we see in the models is that we have two main roles for carbon dioxide removal. The first one is to offset uh, emissions from hard to abate uh, sectors. The second one is to achieve net negative CO2 emissions. Um, here we see the four illustrative pathways that were described in the one and a half degrees report. And um, it basically shows that you can have different mitigation strategies to, in the end, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Uh, and these four pathways have, um, all of them uh, require carbon dioxide removal. As you can see in the yellow and orange areas below the, the zero line in the graph. Um, and three of them also require carbon capture and storage. There's one, P1, that doesn't involve CCS, uh, but it does um, involve really stringent uh, deep emission reductions, actually already starting years ago. Um, <laughs> and yeah, very uh, also behavioral changes, lifestyle changes. Um, so what we also see here is that dependent on the near-term uh, emission reductions, uh, we realize we can have either a larger or um, well, a less large total amount of carbon dioxide removal over this century. It, it can vary between 100 and 1,000 billion uh, gigatons of CO2 over the century um, yeah, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Oh, yeah. um, now a little bit about, uh, based on my own research, um, the role of CCS in climate change mitigation. Uh, we looked at the, the steel industry and one particular residual gas in the steel industry, basic oxygen furnace gas. And we looked what, at what the best uh, way is or for the environment to utilize this uh, basic oxygen furnace gas. And currently, um, this can be flared. Uh, it can also be used to produce electricity or heat by combusting this gas, which consists of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen, and nitrogen. But we also uh, looked at um, specific technology called sorption enhanced water gas shift, which can be used to separate the CO2 from the stream and also uh, to, such that you have a stream left of hydrogen and nitrogen. This means that you can um, instead also uh, capture the CO2 and store it, uh, even after you made urea out of this stream, which is a fertilizer. So based on the life cycle assessment that we did, where you see the red areas above the graph um, are the emissions per kilogram of buff, of, of buff gas, the basic ocean furnace gas utilized. And the, the lighter red ones are below the zero line are avoided emissions from, uh, for example, um, the applications that you didn't have to produce anymore. So if you would produce urea from this basic ocean furnace gas, we assume that you avoid conventional urea production. And then the, the black dots are the net greenhouse gas emissions of using this buff gas. But I do want to stress that even though it's very clear from this graph that um, the options that do include CO2 uh, storage, the, the black dots below the zero, uh, zero line, these negative values, do not mean negative emissions. The only thing that it means is that 
urea, urea production with C CCS from buff gas is better than conventional urea production. And with that note, I'll uh, hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Kian. So uh, our next speaker is Matthias Honegger uh, from NetRapido. He is a senior research associate at Perspectives Climate Research. Um, his work focuses on practical governance challenges posed by the need to limit global warming uh, and the present day reliance on carbon dioxide removal and sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Um, so this whole topic is kind of awkward and I think the way that you phrased it is really uh, on point and uh, we, we've seen from the models what theoretically is needed, but how do we bridge that into what's going on in these halls? Is That's kind of the, the question that we center our work around. Um, and so NetRapido is a project that has been running for three years, I think, uh, and is, is coming to a close right now. But in many ways, it's actually only the be beginning um, in, in, in this ongoing conversation uh, towards more concrete um, insights for policy design, essentially. Um, so we're uh, th three partners in this project, as you can see, working on, on the one hand, technology analysis, readiness assessment of different approaches, um, and then our contribution, looking at governance questions and uh, financial incentive schemes that kind of goes hand in hand, and uh, Climate Strategies, who's uh, also hosting this event, um, engaging with stakeholders and sort of also running what we do here, which is learning from one another um, and discussing. Um, I, I also want to point out uh, two um, sort of reflections uh, that we uh, have on our blog. Uh, one uh, from Michael Opelstein, one of the sort of first um, figures thinking about removals. Um, and so sort of taking this uh, look back and, and seeing really this is, as you pointed out, something that has a long history already. Um, and uh, and uh, well, Hannah Marie, who's sitting next to me, uh, also recently uh, contributed to this discussion um, and, and is very much engaged in this, uh, as you will hear, in the Nordic region. And uh, so uh, some reflections there as well, if you're interested to, to see that. Some other outputs. Uh, basically file into these sort of reflections. What do we do at this point in time under the Paris Agreement? What can uh, removals do? Uh, how do we have to approach them? Um, how do we have to think of them? So this uh, notion of sewage treatment for the skies is something that we sort of use as a phrase to reflect on the, the scale and the sort of the need for us to get to a point as a society where removals are basically taken for granted because government is in a way uh, taking up its responsibility um, to make sure that we leave our environment as it should be, uh, which is not polluted essentially. And a couple of uh, uh, academic uh, publications uh, basically, which I'll summarize here <laughs> very short. Um, so one key message really, and this still needs to be said, is carbon removal is a form of the mitigation of climate change. and so legally speaking, and so there's a couple of uh, points that we can draw from the rich history of mitigation overall, also from emissions reductions, uh, policy design, and uh, the principles that guide these uh, developments that can be translated to carbon dioxide removal as well. And so this translation is something that we, we try to do um, in, in several of these publications. Uh, I think for many of you, this is already at the back of your minds when you think about removals. We need to take back what's in the bathtub. Um, and CCS is a key element in that discussion. So CCS, as a part of what you do when you have the carbon captured already from the atmosphere, directly from the atmosphere or through biomass uh, use. And uh, as the, the, the straw there illustrates, this is not something that's easy per se. So again, the history uh, of CCS specifically points to this being a thorny topic in uh, policy, uh, in, in environmental movements, and in this uh, venue as well. It's not something that has a natural uh, proponent. And I think 
now with net, net zero targets, we see this dynamic sort of, uh, we see a step change in that dynamic um, and a recognition of this need uh, much more acutely than we have so far. And so in this context, I see six necessary conditions. This is based basically on, on a look, uh, a strong look at the current peer reviewed uh, literature on the topic. And the first of all is really to be clear, A, on what we mean by uh, certain terms. Uh, we, we see much confusion around emissions reductions and removing CO2 or other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The latter is sometimes confused with emis emissions reductions. And so the way in which CCS can act for the removals is, as I said, in combination with CO2 being captured from the atmosphere, either directly or through the use of biomass. And uh, the, the use of CCS based on fossil or cement plants has arguably, in terms of volume, a much greater role, but is something different. And we need to be clear on that. Um, and we need to rapidly accelerate. I think this is already clear from the previous uh, inputs. Uh, and we need, uh, where appropriate, really early on a public participation because much of this will be coming out of taxpayers' pockets uh, in the end of the day. Uh, and we need to transition to real scaled activities uh, rapidly. We can't just stick with pilot activities. And we need to do a lot more work on the MRV, on tracking carbon so that it's actually credible and the public will long term only trust this if it is done well from the beginning. And finally, sustainable development is sort of the boundary condition in which all of this has to take place. Okay, thank you very much, Matthias. So uh, I'm going to move on to Hannah Ahonen from NetRapido. You're an environmental economist with 20 years of experience, a senior consultant at Perspectives to Climate Research, uh, and uh, you've got, you're going to talk to us about your work. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for the great background setup. So I will be reflecting on the things that have been said here and, and how that has been implemented in the Nordic context, because that's a very exciting region, um, as you will see in a moment, on all the different aspects of, um, I'm focusing on negative uh, emission technologies, but there is the broader um, activities on carbon capture and storage, also for fossil-based um, components as well. Um, but if I move first, so the Nordics are a really interesting region because they, they're aiming to be carbon neutral as a region and also all of them have their own carbon neutrality and carbon negativity um, targets. Finland is aiming to be net negative by 2035 or soon after. And that really pushes these future things into the current situation because it's 15 years away. And that's where it starts to be showing, showing up in the short-term plans rather than the long-term plans. Uh, some of the first places it's going to be in Finland, then Sweden also has a net negativity target from 2045 onwards. Um, and they have a very comprehensive uh, plan for it with um, a lot of details. It's 800 pages, so I'm not going to summarize it here. So these countries have um, their own plans. They also have a plan to work together uh, so that the entire region would be then um, carbon neutral. They want to lead by example so that they can then facilitate also carbon neutrality and net negative emissions by other countries because you can also provide services outside of the Nord Nordic region so they could catalyze the, the global mitigation. So the aim with the Nordics is to be more than just their own region. And also that the Nordic industry and business would get experience with these um, and then be part of the global transformation. Um, and here it is very clear that this, this discussion is taking um, part in the context of really high ambition. So I think that's the game changer that, that wasn't there maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and then there has been agreement that the Nordics will cooperate, um, enhance their cooperation with CCUS and NETS, and they have a Nordic uh, working group on that. And the interesting thing is that we are a bit of a microcosm um, because Finland and Sweden are very big on bioenergy, existing bioenergy, so there's a lot of potential for biogenic capture uh, and bioenergy also in pulp and paper. Um, and then Norway 
Iceland and Denmark have the storage capacity. Iceland has it in the bedrock, and then Norway and, and um, Denmark in the under, underground ones. And so we have this testing area with international cooperation within the Nordics as a, as a testing region. So it's very exciting. And as you can see from the next slide, um, not going to read through all of them, but all of the countries are doing different things. And the things that Matthias was mentioning um, about innovation support, then for example, the Swedish Industrial Leap is uh, supporting research and innovation finance for industrial emissions, and that includes also um, bioenergy CCS. And as you were mentioning, the, there is a reverse auction being planned for the first commercial scale um, bioenergy CCS that would be coming up in a few, few years time, but the design is coming up very, very shortly. And in Norway, there's a public-private partnership, and here you can see that you need the, the financing from different sources on this long ship CCS project, which includes capture, it includes transport, it includes storage, and there's a lot of um, different components there, but they're also going from piloting to commercial um, scale there. And then Norway offering uh, storage as a service for others. Um, like in Finland, we don't have the storage, so then we would transport it there. In Iceland, we have an exciting um, technology called Carbfix, where they store it in the in the bedrock. And in Denmark, you have also um, you have an innovation fund that is specializing. One of the areas is CCUS. Um, there is a couple of storage uh, projects. Uh, there's one capture cluster, and and there's innovation. So there's different types of of support there, and moving from one to the other. And there's coming these um, different kind of strategies as well. And in Finland, we have this climate fund, which is brand new, and that could be investing in commercial stage or, or sort of early demonstration projects as well. So all of this together, um, basically put together, then the Nordics can be a very powerful testing area. And, and one thing that I would finish off with, because my background is in carbon markets, is that because it has international cooperation elements, and it could be that Sweden could be supporting um, bioenergy in Finland because it would make more sense because there might be some specific technological details, and then it would be transported to Norway, and you would really have to know the uh, monitoring reporting verification and the accounting properly so that you could decide how you account, and maybe the financier would want to count the reductions rather than wherever it's taking place, or sorry, not reductions, removals. Um, and that's <laughs> where Article 6 might actually uh, come in, and this is a very new kind of way of thinking about Article 6, because it's not how we traditionally think about where this carbon market corporation might happen. Um, but in some ways, when you are crossing borders and you're crossing finance, then this is one opportunity to do Article 6 in the really high hanging fruit. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Hannah. Pass on to um, so finally, uh, we come to Vincent de Hoyt, uh, and he is also from uh, C4U. Uh, he's the Associate Professor of Research Methodology at Radboud University and his research and teaching uh, revolves around increasing the understanding of societal transformations towards sustainability. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, so... <laughs> yeah. uh, just one more, there we go. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll try to share some early insights from our uh, C4U project, which uh, looks at the role, uh, the potential role of CCS in, uh, in steel industry, particularly in, uh, in the North Sea port, the industry cluster uh, that crosses the borders uh, between the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, so when talking about the role of, uh, of carbon and capture and storage, um, we often tend to think about the te technological aspects of, uh, of CCS. What is the technological uh, readiness level? Uh, how does it scale up from first demonstration plans and pilot plans to uh, commercialization? But I think, as uh, earlier, earlier speakers also noted, CCS is uh, um, particularly known for, um, yeah, th there's no proponent, there's, there's no a natural proponent, uh, there, there are implications involved with uh, implementing CCS. Um, so we also need to, to consider societal readiness. Even if the technology will be perfectly developed, that still is not enough to guarantee a successful implementation of CCS. 
So even if we have the technology, we need more. We need societal readiness. And that's what uh, the C4U project allows us uh, to, uh, to investigate. So what if we do um, uh, consider societal readiness, what else is necessary um, in, in addition to uh, technological readiness? So um, for, for us that means that you address uh, concerns that different stakeholders uh, may have. So some of the typical concerns that are expressed around uh, CCS is, well, it could um, it, it could lead to an, a strengthening of carbon lock-in. It could legitimize extracting fossil use. Well, uh, around the COP, there are different discussions on how, this, how that could be avoided. Another concern is a crowd out. Um, how do we make sure that the, 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 the dollars or the euros that go into CCS do not come at the cost of other, uh, perhaps even more long-term, uh, sustainable uh, solutions? Uh, so those concerns need to be addressed, uh, and that's part, uh, part of what it means to be uh, societal ready for large-scale implementation of CCS. And uh, another thing that, um, that we would like to um, stress is that it's not so much about different stakeholders having different mm -hmm. interests. Uh, if you look at, as, as Ruth already expressed, uh, think, the different, okay, actually. Um, I think these are the, the, the progress has been slow so far. Uh, for us, that's also related to how the different is interests of different stakeholders are interrelated. So, um, okay. yeah, thanks. So, for, there are all these different stakeholders and they have all these different interests and those are all necessary conditions for societal readiness, you could say. So for industry, it's typically uh, just as an illustration. We need to have a business case and we need to have a level, play level playing field. For society, it's well. It's either a just transition or there's no transition, uh, and and for for policy for policymakers, it's well. Um, I want to stay in office, so I need to have support for my policies, or I won't um, implement them. So th th these are all the different interests of the different stakeholders. And what I would like to stress is that I think for if we really want to understand societal readiness. We need to look even more at how those different stakes are interrelated. If you consider those interrelations, you would see how those all hang together. Uh, so, there we go. So, yeah, when do you have a just transition? Well, that depends on whether industry um, puts in enough money in the eyes of society. Uh, whether we have a business case and a living playing field, well, that depends on the policy support for CCS. There's no CCS business case without policy support. Um, whether there is uh, policy, whether there's a, uh, support for policy, well, it depends on society and the legitimacy, the, the, the mandate that they grant to their um, uh, representatives to implement such policies. So I think that this may also uh, be one of the mechanisms behind the, um, the, the, well, the slow progress that we have seen in CCS so far. So if you talk to someone on CCS, everyone has their favorite scapegoat. For one, it might be industry. For the other, it might be government. But if you take a step back, uh, you see how all those interests are interrelated. And it's really, this is also, this is a danger that comes with a technology like CCS. But I think it's also an opportunity if you see how this may, how CCS may also act as an aligner of goals. In the end, uh, many of us have children. We have, we share same goals about the future of our planet, uh, and CCS may be um, an option that aligns our interest if we can make, uh, if we can see those interrelations um, and make this work for all uh, stakeholders uh, involved. So just to, uh, to conclude, um, the, if we want to reach effective climate action, we need to understand societal readiness, specifically for a technology like, uh, like CCS. And if we want to understand societal readiness, we don't need to only um, look at the different stakeholders and their, their concerns, but we also need to address how those different concerns are uh, interrelated.
Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. So we've heard about the role that CCS and NETS can play in ch climate change mitigation. We've heard about the governance that is needed. We've heard about Nordic developments uh, and financing uh, of NETS and societal readiness. Um, so um, I would like to just open to the floor, I think, for one or two questions before I pose a final question to our panelists. So um, would anybody like to ask a question of what they've heard so far? OK, there's no question at the moment. So I'm going to ask mine. I'm thrilled. So I mean, these are all very different dimensions. And it's really clear that any project trying to get off the ground at the moment is sort of potentially could be struggling with all of these things, whether it's cross-border issues, uh, the, the societal readiness, uh, uh, making the business case, uh, and, and, the, and the governance arrangements. But if, if you were to just pick one policy that would really shift the dial in, maybe in your area, um, what would that be? What would you ask for if you could tell the whole of COP to implement one policy and it would be done uh, and it would solve, solve this issue? What would it be? Uh, Kian, see you first. Yeah, I think that's quite a difficult question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I guess for me, um, mostly working on life cycle assessment and looking at the whole life cycle of different technologies um, and implementing them in different sectors, mainly looking at, at for example, carbon capture and utilization uh, as, yeah, as opposed to carbon capture and storage. I think for all policies that need are formulated in this uh, in these sectors, it will be very important to look at the entire life cycle. Um, because I quite often see that, for example, in, in formulating emission reductions that can be achieved from carbon capture and utilization, so for example, producing a chemical from the CO2, it, it seems to be a bit unclear who can claim that they have um, avoided the emission of this initial molecule of, so, of CO2. So is it the steel industry? Or is it the chemical industry? So the provenance, really, of the CO2. Yeah, and then permanent. Exactly, and and I just then, for example, see the steel industry claiming that they are uh, carbon neutral because they, you know, haven't emitted the CO2. The chemical industry claiming that they are carbon neutral because <laughs> the, yeah, if they no emit the CO2, exactly, that's indeed my point. Thank yeah, you very, very much. Very good. No double counting from Clean. So um, from Matthias, um, what about you? It doesn't have to be on governance, but I suspect. It yeah. Might be. So I mean, it's a, it's a pretty tricky question uh, given that I don't think there is a solvol approach or a policy instrument as such. But uh, I mean, to to sort of expand the scope slightly, I would say, is full-on implementation of the Paris Agreement. And most importantly, I think the ingredient that needs to, to still rise and still uh, come out more strongly even now is public pressure. And, and really, the scrutiny uh, that brings light into all the difficult to understand technical issues that ultimately underpin whether there is ambition or not. So uh, public pressure and transparency <laughs> in that process. But there is there is quite a bit of public pressure and uh, and transparency in the Nordic region, isn't there? So maybe that's why you've been able to kind of stride ahead on some of this. But what is what is still lacking in in your view, Hannah? Yeah, I'm wondering about the public pressure and how much where it's actually coming from, the the momentum in the Nordic countries, and and how is is it going to the scale? or does that need something? And maybe not a policy, but I think when Nordic countries start to do their sectoral roadmaps, the need will become more evident and concrete in those sectors. Uh, it's not something separate from, from what's happening in the other sectors in, in that basically if you want to get to net zero in a particular sector and you're starting to think about how, that's when you start to realize you need it. It's a necessity, it's not an option, and then that's, I think, where the pressure starts to come from on a broader societal basis when it's less abstract. And so I'm hoping that through also the first actual examples, in Norway, for example, it's a waste incineration, so it's half fossil, half organic, so it's not even one or the other. But this starts to show what we're talking about. 
and then maybe carbon capture in steel. And that, when you have the real examples, then you can start building the acceptance. But without the acceptance, you don't have the pressure and you don't actually get where it goes. So I don't know if yeah. it's a policy, but I think piloting, and, and that's really useful. Just uh, get it, getting on and delivering some early projects is the, you know, they were cheering your answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I very much agree with you. <laughs> getting on and, and implementing some early projects and showing what can be done with things like heavy industry, uh, really important. And obviously that's behind the UK's announcement to do its first two clusters. And I think that is really seen as kind of those regions opportunity to become zero carbon and through that process attract inward investment into what otherwise might be declining industries. Um, so I think that's got something to do with, with maybe getting at least regional support for, for these things. But you, I was really interested in, in what you talked about, Vincent, because it was almost like the opposite of a vicious circle. But I don't know what you call that, but you know, it could become a vicious circle if uh, you know, faith is lost at any point along it, and I think the injection point is yep. what is the is the policy commitment, is the firm uh, targets at national or maybe, as you say, sectoral level, or, or is there well, another point in the circle where we could break this? I think what 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 would be a necessary condition to make this a first by circle cycle would be to uh, to increase trust. So I think trust is really key in, in making this a virtuous cycle. So trust in industry, but also trust in government. Uh, both are necessary to address concerns like uh, why is taxpayer money going to industry? Um, uh, and um, uh, what do uh, government officials do with our mandates? So I think trust is key. And then if you think about, okay, well, trust is key, uh, that's uh, something that others may, may agree with. How do, we achieve, how do we achieve more trust? What kind of policies do we have? Mm -hmm. um, well, in that context, I'm really um, confining my answer to societal readiness, of course. I really uh, see much value in early involvement of, uh, of the public, like, uh, like Matthias also uh, addressed in, in your presentation. So early involvement, and that will probably be on a, uh, it needs to be even on a project base. So it really depends on the context and the context and the project whether CCS is the best option or not. And I th really think that there's there are more steps to be made in informing the public and uh, not just informing but also um, uh, co-deciding with the public in the, the long-term strategic issues of uh, what are the implications of CCS. Okay, there are negative implications, but there are also negative implications of green hydrogen. Uh, if you have uh, the windmill in your background, in your backyard. Uh, there are also uh, negative implications of other options. So it's really on a, on a project base, looking at the alternatives and in, involving the public, engaging the public in, um, in those considerations, uh, which could lead, then lead to trust, which is a necessary condition to make next big steps. Thank you. That's great. Oh, there's one question uh, over there. Oh, two. Okay, we've got we've got time. I think for a few questions. Great. Thank you. <laughs> it is. It is, but it's not very loud. Oh, I can't hear it. Now. Or not? We so I'll yeah. go down there and I'll <laughs> I'll say it. There, yeah, let's do there we that. We go low tech. <laughs> but I heard most of it already. <laughs> Oh. Okay, is it a problem that the IPCC greenhouse gas guidelines don't acknowledge direct air capture? Yes, yeah, so does this work now? Is this, is this one working? Yeah. Okay, so you can listen. in terms of the carbon accounting to reward negative emission technologies, BEX is recognized in the IPCC greenhouse gas inventory guidelines, but direct air capture isn't at the moment. Is that a problem? And if it is, what, how do we fix it? So the question was, if I understood correctly, yeah. if, if it's okay, I'll take it. 
Um, whether it's a problem uh, that uh, DAX, direct air carbon capture and storage, is not covered essentially by the guidelines of the IPCC on how to uh, uh, account for, how to report um, uh, sources and sinks of greenhouse gases at a national level. And the answer is yes, absolutely. I, I, I think it's absolutely a problem uh, for a number of reasons. One, of course, for the intended uh, use of those greenhouse gas inventories, which help us understand where we're at in terms of progress. And as DAX might become quite a serious uh, contribution to mitigation efforts that we, we miss essentially right now. And, um, and two, uh, it, it sort of uh, plays into the whole situation where DAX policy, there's no targeted policies for that sort of uh, activity at the moment that is embedded within mitigation planning of, of countries, I think, in, in that context. I don't know if I think the question is what do we do about it, but I don't know if you Yeah, about and that. this is something we have been discussing also. I've been talking to some inventory experts about it on how hard would it be to include it. So it's possible to include, it's not rocket science as such, you would have to have the, the accounting there, but it's absolutely essential that it, it shows because that's directly linked to their financial incentives, whether it's a market-based incentive or a subsidy or whatever it is, if it's a results-based one. Um, and it's something that's not been done yet, but can be done. So, and, and it's actually something that should be done as a precondition for a lot of the finance to flow. So I'm glad you asked because that was something I would have wanted to have added if I had Excellent. time. Excellent, good question. So there's another question here. Hello, thank you so much. Oh, can't hear. Can we hear now? Yeah, yeah you can listen now. Okay, thank you so much for this great panel. Um, <laughs> I, my question is the role of innovation in accelerating carbon capture and storage. I know that the Nordics are just really on the ball when it comes to innovation. I live in uh, Northwest Territories in the subarctic in Canada. I work for the government there and I'm the one person there who's, um, I have a chief climate officer type role for the Department of Infrastructure and it's really hard to do innovation when the government doesn't have that capacity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what's the role of innovation in carbon capture and storage? What's the role of innovation in carbon capture and storage? She comes from Northwest Canada, from the Canadian government, it's really, really difficult to get innovation uh, going in these areas and he's really interested in the Nordic approach to that. Well, yeah, I think that the role of innovation finance has been critical to take the projects forward from, from ideas and little small demonstration efforts to commercial scale. And they're the, the, the ones that we are seeing in the Nordics, they have been receiving innovation fund uh, financing and there's a Danish innovation fund, there's a Finnish one, so forth, and the, and the Swedish one. So it's been absolutely crucial to get it from one place to the next. Um, I don't know if you've got any. No, I, I'd say just bigger picture, uh, you know, every technology element needs to be brought up at, from the stage where it's at. And so for CCS, that is now at plan, pilot plant stage, but for others, direct air capture, um, you know, there's still more need for also uh, earlier research and development funding and um, and of course what's key for the private sector in the longer term is to have that certainty so going even beyond just uh, that that sort of value of death part that is innovation uh, money but into the promise of, of a somewhat stable um, volume and and uh, price level for for carbon flows in that sense yeah yeah, so the funding of the operational stage yeah, I, is really important. Yeah, but well. then sort of going from innovation to the first commercial scale, and then from the, the first to the replication, that can't be public money anymore. So that's where you really need to start getting the carbon price, which then requires the accounting. So it's a continuum of different types, but you don't get from one to the other without, if you have a gap there. Okay, um, well, I think we are due to finish up. So um, I know there were other questions. Um, I'm really sorry, we haven't got time for any more. But I think we've had a really, really good discussion about the sort of challenges facing these early projects. There are some clear policy recommendations from the panelists here, some really good uh, suggestions from the audience as well. So I think we, we really need to see the potential of these technologies recognized in all of the policy and government frameworks here at COP26 and in future UNFCCC discussions, um, but also at the national level 
regional cooperation as well to really maximise potential uh, of these technologies across different countries. And also a kind of, I think when we start to see proper targets and sectoral targets, we, are, we all believe that actually that's when we'll start to see these technologies really be seen as essential and start to be deployed at scale. Okay, well thank you everyone. Uh, and thanks to our steam panel. Thank panelists. you very much.